Let's pray this morning. God, we are here today because of you. There's really no other reason other than we need you in our lives and we need a regular encounter with you. God, I pray today that you speak to us. God, there are a lot of voices that are out there in the world that want to bring a message, that want our attention, but it's your voice that we want to hear. And so we've set aside this time to be here, to hear what you are saying. And God, I thank you this morning that we're going to hear clearly, God, and that not only are we going to be hearers, but we're also going to be doers in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, my wife and I were gone this past week to South Carolina to attend a pastor's conference. And there were probably around 3,000, maybe 2,500 to 3,000 pastors and frontline leaders that were there. Now, this was a great conference for so many reasons. There was a lot of great information that was given. There was a lot of great stuff that was shared. And that's one of the reasons that we go because we want to keep growing as pastors. We want to keep, uh, keep an edge on us. We, we, we want to hear. We want to grow. We, we need people speaking into our lives as well. But I think one of the highlights, and there were many, one of the highlights of this conference was the last night of the conference when probably out of these 2,500 people, 1,000 were pastors. And on the last night to see 1,000 pastors on their knees before God, crying out to God for themselves, crying out to God for their churches and crying out to God for their communities. I mean, it was heartbreaking and, and heartwarming at the same time of realizing there are some frontline pastors and believers that are saying, God, use me and we need you more than we've ever needed you. It was just a real God moment. But also in that conference, there was a word that came. Now, anytime we go to a conference, our heart is, you know, God, give us one or two things that we can bring back for our church. You can't take everything that you hear. You can't take every idea. God, but if you can give us one thing, maybe to share with staff, maybe do a work in us, or maybe something that, that, that we can add to our church and what we're doing, something that just kind of keeps us current and, and going the way, direction we need to go. And God gave a word. There were some of those things, but God gave a word. In fact, it was, it was maybe as much of a rebuke as it was a word. And I wrote it down because I want to get it right and I want to share it with you this morning. And this whole thing kind of deals with the COVID culture that we see in the church. Has nothing to do with mask or no mask. Has nothing to do with vax or no vax. It's just this post-COVID culture. And it said, people aren't coming back to our churches because. And like me and a lot of other pastors were like, yeah, come on, tell us. We need to know. People are not coming back to our churches because most pastors were busy creating followers and not making disciples. I don't know if that hit you like it hit a bunch of us pastors, but I'm going to read that to you again. People aren't coming back because most pastors were busy creating followers and not making disciples. Nowhere in the Bible are we called to make followers, but we are told very specifically that we are to create disciples. Do you realize this morning that as pastors, pastors are not called to be rock stars or to even have a celebrity status. Pastors are called to be shepherds. And one thing I can tell you about a shepherd is that a shepherd usually smells like the sheep. You cannot pastor away from the sheep and just make an appearance. If you're going to be a shepherd, you've got to know the people. You've got to be involved with people. You've got to get into ministry because you love people. Being a pastor is being a shepherd, living a life of sacrifice, being a leader, uh, bringing messages like this. As sometimes you have to call it like it is. But God has called us to not gather followers around us, but to make disciples. And let me tell you the difference between a believer and a disciple. Being a believer is where we start. Everyone starts saying, you know, I, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. Everybody starts as a believer and that's great. And that's wonderful. And that's where we all need to be. And, and I love seeing people come, becoming believers, putting their faith in God. But that's not the end. That's just the beginning. 
God doesn't want you to stay just a believer. God wants you to become a disciple. And so what he does is he takes you on this journey and you begin to learn how to live like Jesus. You begin to learn how to love like Jesus. You begin to learn, learn to live a life that God is walking you through, showing you uh, how to be more like Jesus and how to love Jesus more. I've got a great question for you this morning. It's very personal, but ask yourself this question. How would your life look if you were more passionate for God? How would your life look if you were more passionate for God? How would your marriage look if you were more passionate for God and having God in your marriage? I can guarantee you it would look different. How would your life look? How would your relationship with your kids look? How would your kids look different if you were more passionate about God and following his plan? And you can take that through any area of life. How would your work look if you were more passionate about God? How would your worship look if we were more passionate for God? How would our church look if we were more passionate for God? And I'm just gonna be honest with you here, and you've heard me say this before, that every one of us here can be more passionate for God. I don't think, every, I don't think any of us here are going 110% for God. We all can look at our lives and say, you know what? I could be a little more committed here. I could be a little more devoted here. I could give a little bit more in this direction. Our life would look different. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus is talking to a group of disciples and want to be disciples. And he says some very powerful things. And one of the things he says about being a disciple following him, he said, listen, you got to hate your mother and your father. You got to hate your brother and your sister. Wow. Now, before we get too far into this, Jesus is not talking about actually hating them. Some of you are saying, oops, too late. <laughs> Been there, done that. What he's talking about is your love for him in comparison. See, our love for God ought to be so out there, so prevalent, so visual, and, and so passionate for him that every other, every other relationship we have looks like hate. You see what he's saying there? You don't hate people, but there's such a difference that when I say I love God, there's nothing else to compare it to. That's what he's talking about to his disciples there. And then he says this. He says, and then I want you to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Now, today with social media, we would probably be more accurate saying, saying it this way to deny your selfie. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because we are all into selfies. Look, here I am. Look, here I am eating breakfast. Look, here I am picking out a shirt. Look, here I am. It's all about me. Do you know that last year over 250 people died taking selfies? <laughs> really? I mean, they fell off cliffs, they fell under water, they walked out into traffic, some were eaten by animals. I'm being serious. They were so self-absorbed in them and in what they're doing that they totally forgot about the world around them. They were so focused on themselves. And what God is saying to be a disciple is turn the lens around. Get the lens off of you and realize there are other people out there that God can use our lives to impact their lives. If any man be a disciple, let him deny his selfie. Take up his cross and follow me, make your life as a gift to God and let God use you. Now, here's the thing about preaching or bringing a message. And see if you agree with this, that sometimes preaching, sometimes when you sit in a service, preaching a message is a healing word. Now, if you know me, I'm a Barnabas. You know, I said the other day, people say, are, 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 you, are, are you Armenian? Are you Calvinist? No, I'm neither one of those. I'm a Barnabas. I'm an encourager. I'm not smart enough to go into all the theology about being Armenian or being, uh, being Calvinist. I'm just telling you, I'm an encourager. I love, I love to be a distributor of hope. I like to help people. I like to help people get better. I like to see them get out of their problem and get on with their life. And so sometimes preaching is healing. Sometimes we need a healing word. Sometimes we, we're just hurting and we're aching and we need, we need God to give a word to our hearts. And that happens in church so many times. And, and sometimes preaching is a healing word. But sometimes it's a cutting word. 
Now, when I I say cutting, I I don't mean like just a hack job, just cutting somebody up and hurting them. It's more like a surgeon doing surgery, cutting away things out of our lives that we don't need. And same way with your Bible. Sometimes when you sit down and you read your Bible, sometimes sometimes it comforts you and sometimes it challenges you. Sometimes preaching comforts you and sometimes preaching challenges you. But how many know we need both in our lives? And so this morning, if I'm challenging you, and this is a challenging word, that's a good thing because God always uses these things to make us better. Most everyone here has two types of friends. Or I can say it this way, we we have two types of friends in our lives. One is a good friend and the other is a real friend. Now, a good friend is always going to tell you, hey, you're okay. It's not you, it's them. You're okay. You weren't wrong. They're wrong. Don't worry about it. You're perfect. That's what a good friend does. But a real friend is different because a real friend will tell you the truth. A real friend will tell you you're kind of a jerk. A real friend will say it's all your fault. A real friend will say, you need to straighten your act up because, man, the way you're acting. See, a real friend will find your blind spots and reveal them to you. I'm just saying this morning, we don't need good friends. We need real friends. Your Bible is a real friend. It will tell you what you need to do and what you don't need to do. It is a word of encouragement and is a word of challenge at the same time. So in Revelation chapter two, and I've been reading a lot in Revelation, getting ready for this series coming up, is that Jesus is talking, giving this revelation to John, and he's dealing with seven churches in Revelation. And in this particular church, it's the church at Pergamum, he's talking to them and he says, there's a problem, you're a good church, you're doing a lot of great things, you got a lot of good things going on, I understand. He said, but here's your problem. Jesus is being a real friend. And he says, your problem is you've got a spirit of compromise in your life. You got a spirit of compromise in the church. So I've often said that the biggest problems that the church is going to face are not problems from outside, but problems from inside. And so Jesus is telling this church, you got to deal with the compromise. And then he goes on in verse 13 and he says, listen, as a church, and this is where they were geographically, they were in a place that called Satan's stronghold. There was so much occult activity going on in this particular place that, that everywhere you go, there were false gods and false idols. There were different, uh, different uh, uh, satanic groups that were there. And, and any God and every God that could be worshiped was there. And it was a literal stronghold. And so what God was saying, and this is kind of paraphrased, but you can go back and read it for yourself. What he's saying there is that Satan, where where your church is, is a place where Satan is enthroned. But one of the next things he says was basically, but I'm still not going to allow you to make excuses. I understand you are in a hell hole, but still yet you can overcome. Still yet you don't have to compromise. And so today, when we talk about Satan being enthroned, like in our life, it would be a stronghold. Maybe it's an addiction, maybe it's a thought, maybe it's a habit, something that you're battling with and the struggle is real. And I know we all have things that we're battling. We all have things that we have to deal with in our lives. That's just life. And God says, I I, I know your struggle. Listen, aren't you glad this morning that God knows what you're facing? God knows, God, God understands, but he still is not going to allow you to compromise. God knows what you're facing. Remember, Jesus came as a man and he walked through every temptation that you and I will ever face. He walked through every storm that you and I will ever face. And so God knows, he knows the struggle is real. He knows what you're facing. He gets it. But he still says, I'm not changing my standard. What I will do is I will give you more grace to get through what you're going through. So thank God for grace. We don't have to live under condemnation. We don't have to live under uh, under that heaviness and under that yoke. But God says, "You, you still can't compromise. I'll give you grace. And so again, this is where I need to be careful here because if I'm not careful, people are gonna accuse me of being mean or even worse, a grumpy old man. And I'm not. 
I'm a pastor. But sometimes as a pastor, you just have to say some things. I'm not mad. I'm not a grumpy old man. I love you. But here it is. There are not two flavors of Christianity. There's not a caffeinated version and a decaf version. Right? Someone said concerning the decaf, it won't wake you up or shake you up. But it won't take you up either. There's not two versions of the Bible. There's not the Holy Bible and the Bible light. I want to share with you two quotes. And these are both from men whose ministry that that I respect, that I have followed over the years. One is from John Bevere. And he makes a statement that goes right along with what I'm talking about today. And he says, we continually, in the church, as pastors, as leaders, we continually lighten the message and lower the standard by incorporating the morals of man and neglecting the commands of God. We've created this inclusive gospel that I don't want it to, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to make you feel bad, and I don't. But I want to tell you the truth. Mark Batterson made this statement. He said, the problem is that we want God on our terms. But we don't get God that way. That's how we get false religion. It's a pick and choose, cut and paste mentality. And the end result is a false God that we have created in our image. In other words, we've we've talked to ourselves and we've convinced ourselves that no matter where we are or what we're doing, God understands. God knows. God knows my situation. God knows my heart. God understands what I'm going through. God knows why I do what I do. And we've convinced ourselves that what we do is okay. It's called an inclusive gospel. And it is showing up everywhere. It is a gospel that is being preached today in churches on the internet, an inclusive gospel. Just do what you can do. Now, no one preaches grace more than I do. Nobody believes in grace more than I do. Trust me, nobody needs grace more than I do. But I can't take the word of God and shape it around my life. I've got to make my life fit into the word of God. John talked about the doctrine of two people in the book of Revelation. He talked about the doctrine of Baal and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And I don't have time to break it down in the few minutes that I have here, but I want to give you just the headlines of what these are. The doctrine of Baal was this. Baal was a prophet in the Old Testament. And so all these other nations got together and they were so frustrated with Israel because they couldn't conquer Israel. So they said, what we need is we need a prophet that will put a curse on Israel. So they went and they found a prophet, Baal, and they said, hey, we will hire you. So this was a for hire prophet, okay, that was going to come in and curse the nation of Israel. And so on several different occasions, Baal tried to put a curse on Israel. But how many of you know today that you can't curse what God has blessed? And every time he would try to curse Israel, nothing would happen. And he did it several times. And every time he did it, nothing happened. So Baal said, I've got to try something different. I cannot put a curse on Israel. But what I can do is I can make Israel curse themselves. And so Baal went in with a gospel that said, with a message that said opposite of what God had said. It doesn't matter. Just do what you want to do. And so they begin to marry outside of their tribe and, and different wars and, and, and just different things that begin to happen. There wasn't a racial thing. It was just a thing that, that God was trying to keep Israel Israel. They went against the commands of God. And Israel, because they didn't follow God's command, but they followed something that sounded good to them, lost the blessing and ended up in captivity. So that's the, that's the message of Baal, a message of compromise. Compromise will never get you where you want to go. Compromise always leads to bondage. 
But then he said, here's the message of the Nicolaitans. They were a New Testament group of people that came into the church after Paul came in and said, forget about religion. Jesus is about relationship. There's a New Testament group that said, well, we, we can't forget about religion or we're gonna give you our own version of religion. So what they said was this, they, they wrongly read the scripture and basically it's a little more complicated than this, but this is, as, this is how I understand it. So the Nicolaitans came in and said, all right, here's what you do because living this life that's committed to God, whew, that's hard. So let's do this. They came up with this theology. It's that since, since being born again is a spiritual thing and it's about your spirit, then let's just forget about the body. See, it's a spiritual thing. So it's your spirit that God wants. So your body can do anything and everything. Doesn't matter. Party hardy, dude. Hang out, have sex with anybody you want. Doesn't matter because it's a fleshly thing. You have spirit and you have flesh. God has a spirit. You take the flesh. And Paul said, no, that's not how it works. As long as you're in this life, they are connected. All right. When you die, your spirit leaves this body. But until then, you as a spirit are responsible for this body. And what happened was all of this compromise came into the church. So that's the doctrine that he's talking about through all of this different compromise. Let me share with you a story. See, the Nicolaitans taught casual living. It's the story of a builder, built beautiful houses, very expensive houses. And one day he decided after years of doing this, he said, I'm gonna retire. And so he called his foreman in. He said, we're gonna build my last house but I wanna go out in style. I want it to be the most beautiful house that we've ever built together. You've worked with me for 30 years and I want this to be the most beautiful house that we have ever built. So the foreman said, okay, I've got it. So they began building this grand, beautiful house and the foreman thought, okay, when I finish this house, I'm out of a job. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut every corner that I can. I'm gonna use the cheapest material that I can I'm gonna use less material than I normally use. I'm gonna hire the cheapest labor that I can to do this. Oh, cosmetically, it's going to look good, but I'm gonna know behind the scenes, you know, it is a house that I've cut every corner that I can on wood, on supplies, on craftsmanship, on everything. So finally, after building this beautiful house, it is finished. And I mean, on the outside, it looked amazing. It, it impressed the builder that he loved it so much. But the foreman knew on the inside, it was not a good house. The builder looked at the house and he took the keys out and he said, because you've been such a faithful partner with me, I'm gifting you with this house. <laughs> Compromise never gets us where we wanna go. It always hurts the life that we wanna live. So I thought about, oh, how do, I, how do I describe what commitment looks like? And I didn't wanna use the Webster Dictionary, you know, it just kinda doesn't hit the spot. And so I'm gonna give you three examples of what God is looking for this morning. One's a baseball example. The other's an airplane example. And the other example is my friend Roger's cat. So here we go. If there's any baseball players in the house, you'll get this. That if you're on first base and you're getting ready to steal second base, you have to lead off of first base. And there's a certain place of leading off. You can go so far, you only go far enough so that if the pitcher changes his mind and throws the ball to first rather than the catcher, you've got time to dive back to first base and be safe. So they always kind of find that sweet spot. But there is a spot that if you're really going to go to second base and you're going to steal second, there is a place where you get to realize I can no longer get back to first. That means I have no more options. I'm totally committed to second base. That means my focus is second base. There's no going back. I can't look back. I'm going to go to a place I will never be able to turn back. I, my focus has to be forward with everything I've got to get to second base. That's commitment. That's what it looks like to go forward with God. The second illustration is a pilot flying a plane. 
that when you're going down the runway, you've got those runways are only so long. That means there's a place at the runway that where you either have to have enough speed and enough thrust that when you push that throttle forward, that plane is going to go up. And there's a certain place that you can't change your mind. You can't say, oops, not fast enough. You, you have to make the call. I either have to shut this thing down now or I've got to give it everything that I've got and pull up on that throttle and make this thing go. That's what commitment looks like. And the third example is my friend Roger's cat. This guy, Roger, had a cat and it was a fat cat. And he said, no matter where this cat was in our house, he always wanted to be somewhere else. So if he was inside and the door open, he wanted to go outside. If he was outside and the door open, he wanted to come inside. Any cat owners in the house? I know what I'm talking about. We're gonna pray for you. God will give you a dog. Amen. <laughs> so wherever he was, the cat either wanted in or the cat wanted out. And as I said, he was a fat cat, so he was never in a hurry. He'd, he'd, he'd wander in, he'd wander out every time the door opened. Well, one day somebody changed the spring on the screen door because it was just kind of staying open and not closing tight. But nobody told the cat that now the door closes faster and harder. The cat's still in slow mode. And so he said, we get, the, we get it changed, we're checking it out, we open the door and the cat gets up and the cat starts to walk out the door and he makes it about halfway before the door hits him in the side and pins him beside the, to the door frame. He said, you would not believe the noise that that cat made. He was stuck in the middle. He couldn't go forward and he couldn't go backward. That's compromise. We can either live a life of compromise, one foot in the world and one foot in the church, or we can live a life of commitment. God didn't call us to be just believers. He didn't call us to be followers. He called us to be disciples. And maybe if there's any area that if we looked at that, why have people not come back? There's some that aren't gonna come back. It just ain't gonna happen. And it breaks my heart to realize that people are just done with church. I understand there are people that are not coming back because of health issues. I get it. We have lost friends. We've lost ministers to this COVID. I get it. It's real. I understand. There are people that, that don't come because of health issues. I fully understand. I get it. But there are a lot that aren't coming back because they just lost a habit. They lost a commitment. And I'm just saying, God's called us to be disciples, all in, followers of God. You still love me this morning? Some of you say, never really liked you to begin with, but <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Stand with me this morning, if you would, please. I wanna go back to the question that I asked. How would your life look different If you were more passionate about God. Because again, I guarantee you, it will look different, noticeably different. So I want you to close your eyes for just a moment and I want you to just hear what God is saying. What is God speaking to your heart? See, those are the only words that at the end of the day that really matter. What is God saying? but I don't want us to be hearers only. I want us to be doers. And so this morning, God is looking for commitment. Now I understand this, you're not committing to me, but you're making a commitment to God. It may be as simple as saying, God, I need to be more passion filled. My walk with you. Maybe it's to be more passion filled in my marriage. 
Praise God for that. That's huge. More passionate in my worship. I could turn it up a notch. More passionate in my church. Maybe God is calling you this morning to be a disciple. But whatever it is that God is speaking to you, the ball's in your court. And you have to decide, what am I going to do with what God is saying? So this morning, as we're here, and this time of commitment, this time of of pressing in, this time of, uh, of seeking God, whatever it is, I want you to push in. I want you to press in. Can I share with you one last thing? There were so many things that were were, were shared with us over this past week and, and there were a couple of standouts. One of the speakers at this conference said that I travel across America. I'm literally in churches and in stadiums and conferences all the time. And I talk with a lot of pastors. And here's what I have a lot of pastors that have told me concerning this whole COVID debacle, this whole pandemic because it messed with a lot of churches and it messed with a lot of pastors. There are a lot of pastors in therapy today. I'm not kidding. I said a lot of pastors across this nation have said the same thing. I didn't sign up for this. And this speaker said, I look at them and I say, what did you think you were signing up for? I signed up to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, yet I will follow. I signed up to be committed come hell or high water. I signed up to be a disciple and not a follower. I signed up to get close to God. I signed up to be all in. I don't know what you signed up for, but the Bible says, if any man be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. That's what I signed up for, COVID or no COVID. That's what the job description looks like. As a believer, it's the same thing. Well, I didn't sign up for this. God chose you and you chose Christ. And part of doing that is saying, God, no matter what comes my way, I will follow you. I will be the last man. I will be the last woman standing. I may not be the best, but I will be the last. I will not stop. That's what I signed up for. That's commitment. That's what it means to follow Jesus. You know what we need? I'm going to say it. We need some woke Christians that'll just wake up and say, that's what being a Christian is. That's what being a Christ follower is. It's not about the warm fuzzies. It's about God, here I am. Here's all that I am. And I give myself to you. That's the commitment I made. That's what I signed up for. That's what you signed up for. So close your eyes for just a moment. Whatever God is speaking to you, I want you to take a moment in the presence of God and just respond to that this morning. Whatever it is, whatever it looks like, because remember this, Compromise won't get you where you want to go, but commitment will. Compromise slows you down. Compromise produces less in your life. But commitment will go the distance. And if you're here this morning and you're just simply saying, God, whatever it is, I'm ready to offer my best to you. Then right where you are this morning, if you're willing to join in on this, and I just feel a little old school today, But how many know that's okay? That you say this morning, God, I'm all in. Would you just raise your hand to God and say, God, this morning, I'm all in. I'm all in whatever it takes. 
Just lift your other hand right now and say, God, I, I, I receive your anointing and your strength and your power, Father, over my life in the name of Jesus. I want us to close today with this course and I want us to worship God because I love, I love ending with the word in our heart. Let's join together with this song. Hey guys, thanks for joining us for the service today. I really hope that it was a blessing to you because I know you guys are a blessing to us. If you'd like to follow us on YouTube, there's a link below that you can find that. Also, if you need prayer, you can text the number that's below and we'd be glad to pray for you and pray with you. If you want to consider about joining us financially and contributing to what we're doing here, you can also find that link below as well. Look forward to seeing you next week. We love you guys.